Hello, everybody. This is Chef Rick Moonen interviewing from my studio here in Las Vegas. And here's where we get to dive into deep conversations with some of the original gangsters of cuisine. Ocean Raise is the name of our podcast and because we're all globally connected by the oceans and food culture that it shares. I have a guest today that has a, is a friend, an influencer to me. You know, he, he, he often says that I've helped influence him, but the opposite is quite, quite um, true as well. His name is John Tizar, and uh, John is known for his stylish modern American cuisine prepared with uh, classic European techniques innovative culinary perspectives, and a, a no-nonsense personality. And uh, we'll get into the no-nonsense part because you don't want to be on John's bad side, let me tell you, that's for sure. Uh, John, I'm going to read a little bit about um, his background and then we'll dive right in. Uh, John was born in New York and raised in the Hamptons. Uh, he was always destined to be a cook. His father, although he was a banker, was also a fisherman at heart and took John fees, uh, fishing along the coastal waters of the Atlantic where he would learn to his first passion, surfing. Uh, just a little interjection here. John is definitely a adrenaline junkie. You know, that energy, his passion, his drive is, is, is palatable. Um, at, at age 18, John moved to Pierre's, uh, moved on to Pierre's in the Hamptons where he just, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back. He started his cooking career plating lettuce and tomato on burgers at Magic's Pub in Southampton Beach, New York. And he had a great time, you know, quote unquote, we had it all. There was rock and roll, beer, and pretty girls, and we would work all night and surf all day, reminisced Teaser about his first cooking position. At 18, he moved on to Pierre's in the Hamptons, where he discovered French cuisine as prepared by the chef owner who John took, uh, that took John under his wing. Um, after working his way through the line of Pierre's, he left the States for Paris, where he went to La Varenne School of Cuisine, learning the classical cuisine of the world, and embarked on a journey that would eventually lead him back home to Pierre's once again. Using a portion he had saved from his tuition, he purchased Pierre's from the owners and worked the popular restaurant for six years. Uh, after running the restaurants in the Hamptons, he sold it and moved to New York and ran some of the city's trendiest restaurants, amongst them uh, 44 and X, Hell's Kitchen, uh, Vine, and Supper Club. What happened next was uh, the, the hard party and rock and roll insanity that uh, Anthony Bourdain recounted in Kitchen Confidential. John and uh, other soon-to-be famous chefs spent their time honing their skills and enjoying their life perhaps a little bit too much. Tizo was reluctant to discuss those self-destructive days, though he seemed to be bright inspirations in his career. It certainly hasn't slowed him down one iota. Um, and then finally, he, uh, he moved on to Las Vegas to work for uh, celebrity chef uh, Rick Moonen, some guy out in Vegas. John came out and, um, and, and took the cuisine to a whole nother level at RMC Food in Las Vegas. And um, then he would eventually, after a couple of years, he would uh, go on to move into Dallas, where he would infuse some of the elements that he perfected in Las Vegas at the Rosewood Mansion on Turtle Creek, uh, an iconic restaurant in the United States. In 2007, he was chosen from over 500 applicants to renovate the restaurant's kitchen and reputation as part of a $20 million redo that, re uh, that restored the five-star status the mansion had earned under previous uh, chef, Dean Ferring. John is always, that's what he does. He's, 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 he's like a, a, a technician. He moves in, he takes what he's learned, and he takes everything to the next level. And then he started running these private dining rooms, these tables. I did a couple of events with him out there. It was a blast. I, I, I got the benefit from that. Um, so after leaving the mansion, uh, he opened up uh, Tizar's Modern Steak and Seafood Restaurant in the Woodlands, um, in the, the largest uh, planned community in the United States, I think, or close to it, if it wasn't still. And, um, and it was there for a while, but then realized that the, he didn't want to drain on the owners. So he, he created a, an understanding with them that, you know, my salary, I get it. And, and off he went on his own. And he has just risen uh, straight to the top from there. He's been on TV. I have a list of awards here that would take the full hour, probably. He opened up Knife, which I want you to tell us all about. He, uh, you know, when he's, he's in Texas, best beef, you know, in the country, you know. So he's like, ah, you know, I'll just start uh, aging beef, you know, because they don't really understand it. And he just took it to, again, astronomical levels, won 17 awards, recognitions for Knife. He's got 
th I'm going to read a couple of the top ones because they're impressive and it just keeps on going. I won't put you to sleep, but this is just the way it is. Three time James Beard, uh, best chef Southwest uh, uh, semi finalist, Bravo top chef contestants. He became top chef in, in, in season 10. He was, he was the man to watch. It was awesome. Um, winner of the inaugural season of Food Network's Extreme Chef, uh, named Esquire's best known restaurants for two consecutive years. Yada, yada, yada. On and on and on and on and on. Is there anything else I'm forgetting here? No, too many papers. Let's throw them aside. John Tizar, thank you so much for spending some time with me today, reminiscing, hopefully telling a couple of stories. Now I shut up. You talk for two hours. It's 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 my pleasure, Rick. I, you know, I, I, going through that, listening to you go through that list, I get flash flashbacks of my life. And, and it's it's so bizarre because so many people think they have this knowledge of me and i understand why you know whether it be from back in new york when i worked at uh, vine or i had uh, 13 barrow street you know i was i was very young in the sense that um i was a natural cook like tony says in uh, bourdain always said i was like a natural i was one of the most natural cooks he's ever witnessed Agreed. so and i know he's so important in this world today that's actually turned into something meaningful for me so thank you i, I miss tony but thank you very for that validation and, you know, I've just been, a, it's a weird journey I've been on because I've, I've been a guy that's just needed validation my whole life. You know, I kind of, I was adopted, you know, there was a lot of issues in my life of abandonment and, and parenting and stuff that I really took a long time to work through. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when you're a chef, you, you bring that shit to work with you. You know, you mm -hmm. bring everything with you if you're really a chef. And that's the way I learned, you know, I, I learned through pride, through the glamour, and then through the integrity and then the responsibility of it. Like, you know, like I looked up to restaurateurs when I was a kid. I grew up in that magical part of New York, just like you did, mm -hmm. where like, you know, Sarah Maccioni or like any, you know, any, any doorman that you went to a restaurant, the maitre d' or the host or somebody, my dad was a banker, so he'd have business associates and he'd take me to a restaurant in, in Queens, a Chinese restaurant, a Sun Luck restaurant. And it was like the best Chinese food I've ever had in my life. And they like, the guy's like, hey, Charlie, how you doing? You know, like it was just, so I grew up in this world of like a restaurant was very familiar to me. It's like, you know, John, I just, I'm going to interject for one second. I don't even think I've ever even mentioned this on a podcast. I was one of seven kids. I was the most insecure kid in the world. My self image of myself was, 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 was pretty low. You know, vying for attention two parents working and your seven kids, you know, my biggest fear in my life was public speaking. When I was in high school, I would stay, I couldn't sleep the night before I had to do a presentation in front of my own classmates, you know, and it's that, insecurity and this is my own little theory that makes you successful you wake up every day in the restaurant and you want to hear it from the customers that they're loving it and you don't go home believing it you go home figuring out that's they're just telling me that that's the insecurity that's a, a healthy insecurity because it turns into drive and it allows you to pull out the natural talents that you have i mean you're still surfing you know what was it when you were on a snowboard when uh half hour ago yeah that's, that's what i'm saying <laughs> Yeah. So, so sorry. I mean, good God. I need to, I can't stop living, you know, thanks to the restaurant business and, and, and really the, I'm probably the luckiest man in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't care what anybody else is. It's how you feel. Mm -hmm. And for someone like who's had the similar like identity crisis where it can even swing to self-loathing and doubt we've all been in. And you know, that's like family stuff, let alone you throw life as a chef in there in New York city with the New York times and Gail green and every other chef. I mean, I remember at vine, I got killed by Bill Grimes, one star. Uh, you know, he said, I was, I was easy. I was, I was very good in a very easy listening middle of the road kind of way. Mm -hmm. And it was right there. He took Charlie down. He took a lot of guys that had had chops in the nineties down yep. and everyone was starting to do, it was the beginning of this squiggly tweezer thing that we had to do to get back to realizing that people just really love good food and somebody who cares because that's really what a restaurant is to me and I don't want to go off on a tangent it's like I've had to learn my whole career and by going through television by being insecure by seeking attention by learning from French guys and then learning how not to yell at people and not to bring your personal life and your rage with your father to work with you and your disappointments out on other people it's a, it's a maturation process. And, you know, I'm a slow, I'm a slow learner and I'm a late bloomer. So I've been, so I have a great, I have a great hindsight 
which I think can help people understand the maturation of a real chef, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 you know, God bless guys like Wolfgang or, you know, anybody who's a superstar, people like yourself that just had like life. No, but your career has never had a blip in it. Like, you know, I've had to reinvent myself and been written off and lost. And, you know, I don't blame anybody. I don't say it was that person's fault. It wasn't a critic's fault. I did it all to myself. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know what? So from that guy who went from the burgers to owning a French restaurant at 24, to not knowing anything about business, to going broke, to going into New York, creating 13 Barrow Street and have Gail Green give me like one of the greatest reviews of all she time. She loved you. Not only that, like, you know, the night, two nights after that review, I don't think anybody ever could capture this. And we didn't have cell phones or Insta social media. This right. is 1994, 95, right? right? Mm -hmm. Gail Green puts out the 13 Barrow Street review the next night, Friday night, right? That week, Friday night of that week, I forgot what night that came out or the, you know, you, if you right, subscribe right. to it, you got it early. I knew Jim Devine and Jim Devine introduced me to Gail Green. So I got the, the magazine was like hand delivered to me going, <laughs> dude, this is a love letter. I've never seen Gail write a review like this. So the next Friday night, Bobby Flay, um, Douglas Rodriguez, the entire Maccioni family, Tom Colecchio and I think his, his now wife mm -hmm. were all in a 54 seat restaurant, basically. And you saw the place. It was like a little box. It was yeah. a boat. It was Anissa. Anita Lowe eventually took it over after we did. It was mm -hmm. one three for, for a blip. Those guys hired me and you can't go home. And you, know, you can't, I don't think you can work for a restaurant that you used to own and then go work for other people. It's weird. It's, weird. it's, it's kind of strange. So, you know, I've had these amazing like heights. You know, and, and, you know and, and hanging out with Bourdain every day for three years, and the guy turns into a, a worldwide icon. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's, it's insanity knowing you and, and meeting Charlie through you. And when I first went out on the road and saw what a festival was like or what it meant to be a celebrity chef, and for me, the, the, to have the honor to be the guy that packed it out, prepped it, brought it there, to be the technician to be the respectful person in our business. That's all. I think if any, there's any message for younger chefs, you know, have an ego, understand what you do, but become a technician because, you know, guys like, you know, like Matt Acarino, Jacob Barrios. No, but these guys, whatever they do is like French laundry. Perfect. It's the, it's the exemplary. It's the, it's, it's the, to me, it's the ultimate form of mise en place. When you have guys that you work with and people that, you know, like the crew that I walked into RMC food in New York before Matt went to per se, right. that reinvented my life. I mean, I, I, I was like, just riding, you know, like eighties. It was easy because we were all riding high in New York, American chefs. We all had reviews, all made more <laughs> money than everybody else. We had cocaine and girl, you know, all the, <laughs> You know, we, we could all tell I've been in a cab with David Burke at three o'clock in the morning stories, but we, we've all we just that. did David Burke and he's no. got great. But lesson throughout the whole thing is never give up. Keep reinventing never. yourself. You, you, it's, it's the part of our profession. It used to be a slower momentum. But if you look at even the great chefs of Europe, they had a progression, too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was a slow, tedious progression because it was done by apprenticeship, by time. You know, the 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 media or the magazine world didn't really have us back then. They didn't care Michelin. about us. That was Michelin. Yeah, that was it. You always look to something else. And Americans really, there was red and white tablecloths in the suburbs. I mean, mm -hmm. there was no American cuisine until Alice, Larry, mm -hmm. you, Jonathan, just all threw it in. But, and what was the common thread? Most of you either had European background or had worked for Europeans right. or went to Europe and did it. Yeah. You know, so I don't care from Jeremiah Tower, to, to Alice Waters, to Larry Forgione, to Jonathan Waxman, you name it. The, guy, the founders of American cuisine all took it from someplace in Europe. That's and right. we're still, you know, things don't change. Things don't change, Rick. I'm 63. You're probably the same age. It's like, it's a repetitive cycle. You know, we except every once in a while we get in these foofy cycles where you have to have the, you know, I mean, I don't begrudge anybody tattoos or your whole look or whatever your spiel is. I'm not, I'm not a judgmental person anymore. I've grown, <laughs> I've grown out of that, but you know, but like, but for, for people in power, and I mean power by people who have a voice in this business, which unfortunately can be television or magazines at times, right? It's all helped us and God bless them all. You know, and I love, I, I've been blessed by it. I've been sometimes chastised by it and sometimes ignored by it, right? But that's the game we play. So sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And the sooner you get that message and you become comfortable with yourself, then I think you're really the chef. You're the chef that you've always wanted to be because 
you, you have enough respect from your peers and people around you and you're making people money and you've been around long enough, you know, and I, cause I've seen it both ways. Like I've been people like, Oh, Tzar can open a great restaurant, but it never lasts more than 24 months or 36 months. Or why is he moving around so much? All these personal journeys that you and I go on that people write about or find interesting. And I'm just like this naive kid from Queens that doesn't <laughs> elbow. Cause I raised myself from 17 and the restaurant world saved my life. And I've had to learn every single step of this, except I've been surrounded by some of the greatest people ever to cook. And, and they've inspired me to go find, you know, I, I think there's a bar for everything. You know, if you're a, a pianist, you go see a concert pianist play, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a rock and roll, if you're a guitar player, you wanted to see Stevie Ray Vaughan or Hendrix yeah. or some, some technician, Eddie Van Halen, somebody that just did it differently than anybody else. But you know, they all had in common, they did it naturally. And they did it unconsciously to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So true talent, true talent in this world comes naturally and unconsciously. And then it takes you to become a conscious person and develop that. And that's a difficult process for males because we don't get along with other males in competitive nature. So we start off in this world where chefs are like, oh, oh that guy, oh, fuck, I, I ate his octopus. It was, you know, like stupid shit that comes out of chef's mouths yeah. when we've been to restaurants. And then there have been restaurants that we go to that just, our cerebral life changing. First time I went to Muguritz, mm -hmm. I was just like, you know, I was a knock on this whole elbow and I saw something in between and I understood the theater, but I knew everybody couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to pursue something that I can't replicate. I may right. experience it once to understand it and, and to express it to people that ask me about it. Mm -hmm. Cause I think I have a responsibility to be a culinarian, to be educated or knowledgeable in, in what I do. Sure. And I don't think there's enough history in our business. I think we forget decades and, and, you know, like we oh, pass yeah. over, no, but this whole bullshit of magazines and awards, like skipping generations because, Oh, we need to be more, we need to be more relevant to, to gender, to race, to religion. You know, it's, it's like, you know what? Let's give everybody a fucking trophy in the business and then we don't have to have the awards anymore. We all have a fucking medal and a trophy and a five stars. And then we can just get fucking work in this business because there's a pandemic and half the restaurants are in debt, going out of business. We've all gone to take out and casual. Yeah. Fine dining is dead and people still want to have a party and give medals to people. And then they want to be judgmental about it. I, I, I don't see any progress in that. And I'm sorry if I offend people. But that's just how I was raised. And I, you know, I want a medal that means something to me, a life's ambition, something that I work for, something that people like reinventing the mansion after Dean left. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. You being how many great cheese seafood chefs are there in the world? Right. Does you repair and Chiamusti? That's it. You know, I'm sorry if I for, I've Barcelona, I forgot, but he's so busy doing other shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> but these are guys that live fish, live fish. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the important, you know, to me, that was the, to me, it's the simplest of cuisine, but the most complicated of cuisine because it's the most perishable and you need to have the most knowledge. I'm sorry, but anybody can cook a steak and, you know, an American city steak. And that's, you know, you wanted me to talk about knife. I had to find that. I had to find some kind of integrity, what I was doing to save my soul at a certain point in this business, because, you know, I was on TV. I was an, you know, all these things. I was an asshole. Oh, I was talented, but I'm self-destructive. You know, it's great. Yeah, they were all probably true. But, you know, John Shank, who is an amazing chef in New yep. York, he, mm -hmm. right? He had the monkey bar, and then he opened up his own place there at One Fifth. I forget that. And, and uh, he told me one thing once. He goes, in this business, remember, anybody can change. So the cook could be addicted to drugs last week. He could be a total asshole, totally unreliable, right? But he's got talent, Right. So the talent is the one thing you see. Will they mature? And then sometimes in your career, people come back to you because they, re they realize what you did for them. Mm -hmm. And they never forget that. They have to go wander off. But the greatest compliment that I get, I get guys that leave. Oh, I'm going to go be a chef de cuisine over here. And over here. you know what? Six months later, they all come back because they want to work in an environment that has growth. It's professional. You know what? And they want to go to Pebble Beach. Like Brent wants to go to Pebble Beach and, and high five Danielle Balud and, and, and have an omelet competition with Ludo. You know what I mean? These kids got to get their, their fame game on. Yeah. But, you know, but don't ever let that come before the hospitality or the food. Well, the culture, of, the culture of that environment, John, is what it is. That's what draws you back is because you really feel you're part of the team that's winning. 
And so who doesn't want to be on that team? And another thing, another component, as you were talking, I'm thinking in my head is, is your fearless, um, you know, adrenaline addiction going back and you're fearless to go back. That's what I have the highest amount of respect for you, other than being a fantastic cuisine, cuisinier. I mean, your food is always spot on. I mean, because you're, you're not a tweezer guy, but you're definitely Simple. making sure things are... Yeah, but I mean, come on. Your avocado and grapefruit and hamachi, you know, you know the, the, the flavors and the way you put it together in Texas. It was so... It brought me such a smile. That's what I... When I went to Knife, that's what I had. I just came back from a meal. You know, I was full. <laughs> but I'm like driving by John T's Art restaurant without going in there. And Jake well, took care. It was amazing. That's what we're developing is like, you know, knife and spoon. When I, I've been so lucky, I've, I just got an opportunity. We've been open since um, April. Mm-hmm. Um, we're in Florida at the Ritz Carlton. I took over the, you know, look at this. This knucklehead first it replaces Dean Farring, and then I take over Norman's spot. And you don't replace these guys. You I just don't have kinda, any restaurants you can take over. I'm safe. You just kind of <laughs> fill in. I said, who's next? Emerald? You know, I come out, is Emerald going to give me a spot to take over? You know, it's, it's like, I'm here with the great. I'm, re- I'm 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 coming in after the greats and trying to figure out how to make a name for myself. Right, John and Dean, Dean has been very generous in that. Time out. Okay. You are yes. you are one of the greats. This okay? Just uh, let well, me rest assured, John. You are, and I'm not just okay. saying that. No placation here. I love you with all my heart, and I've watched you. I've studied you. You uh, you don't leave any stone unturned when you're doing research. You know. Okay, so and, and I, I blew through your whole beginning of your career. Let's let's talk about yeah. it now because I could talk to you for we could do a series together. I yeah, swear. we could do a, you and I could. Yeah, yeah. But anybody um, that grew up in the '80s and '90s in New York, we could talk for days. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. So you, dry aging meat. This is this is what you 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 focused on in Texas because they're yes. a wet age. They're a wet age uh, uh, loving country. I mean, country. Well, that's not so far off. So know. here's here's the here's how it, I'll I'll try to give you the quick version. So. Yeah. I'm on Top Chef season 10 because I'm the most hated chef in Dallas. We can talk right. about that later. Mm-hmm. And I'm not really hated, so I'm not worried about it. No. But that's that's interesting to Bravo now all of a sudden because, you know, season one, when I was at RM Seafood, they came and interviewed. They sat down. We did a tasting menu, and they said, no way. You're you're not going on Top Chef with this stuff. You know, like there was no way. It was season one, right? right. And I went, to the, I went to some casino hotel room, interviewed. So and I moved to Texas after I worked for you. And then, you know, Tiffany was on, Trey was on, Casey was on. There was no room for me to get into that momentum, even though I was kind of coming into town and, and, and kind of, you know, like Dean hadn't opened the Ritz yet. You were there. It was like you saw the whole thing. I mean, there's a, there's a yep. tradition and, and a space for the mansion on Turtle Creek, and especially at that time, you know, and to come in and have that opportunity and that platform that Dean just kind of, you know, it was like a relay race. He just handed me the baton and said, you know, you got 18 months before I opened this Ritz Carlton, do something, you know? So I took everything that we had done in Vegas, everything that I had learned in New York and my experience. And I do owe a lot to, you know, Matt Accarino and Anthony Amoroso who had worked with you because they, they led me into a kitchen that was set up like the French laundry and everything and how it was the attention to detail. And then the, your tradition, you yeah. know, and your reputation, it was, it was something to really see. And it was a whole different thing, but now getting to, we got to Spoon, which was 54 seat restaurant in a, in a shopping center in Texas. Right. And I'm flying in fish from Lazicki and Down East and Brown Trading, yep. Bobby Damasco. I got, the, I got the New York, I got the East Coast fish mafia. <laughs> yeah, right? man, they're the best. Shooting it in Southwest Freight right to the door, spending 50 seat restaurants, spending 15 grand a week on seafood, right? But the freshest fish. Nobody had seen, you know, turbo, our Chilean turbo, everything that we work, line court, swordfish, you know, everything, the right oyster, the right clam, you know, everything that I grew up with, your clam chowder. And then I took it to, to different, I used it as a base for different things or sure. as a way to teach people of like to taste the sea and the ocean, you know, like, mm-hmm. you're like teaching people in a landlocked world what the ocean really tastes like is a very complicated thing to do. Mm -hmm. So we did that. We did that and got a lot of acclaim for it, but it wasn't very profitable. So I kept the restaurant going and this investment banker who grew up in Sunnyside, Queens, an Irish guy who went to Fordham University, Mm -hmm. comes from New York, goes to work for Trammell Crow's daughter, right? When I had the commissary, that burger thing I was doing, I did a burger and wine bar thing. He he fell in love with me as a a go-getter. You know, Mm -hmm. like he's in Texas, kind of in the South, but here's... The Yankee, 
sure boxing it out down there and you know <laughs> trying to scratch my way past steven piles and Dean, you know hello i'm over here guys you know that kind of that kind of chef thing we do and then he just he goes i gotta get you we gotta sell this hotel and you're the key to selling the hotel and he goes you want to do it and i said what are you, are you kidding me i've been waiting yeah i watched you and everybody from new york get hotel deals and i saw the I saw the beauty in, in the mechanics of that as a chef. It's kind of like the guy that gets to work for Nike, you know, and just make the sneakers. It's like being a chef de cuisine for you. You know, like I get to do whatever the fuck I want to do all day long creatively. Yep. And I don't got, I don't got to deal with the press. I don't got to talk to Dana Cowan. I don't got to worry about a review. I don't have to do morning television. Right. right? But you know what? I'm in Pebble beach. I'm in Palm beach, every place we've been. Yeah, but you're Gary my you're my stallion in the, in the, in the barn, buddy, you know, <laughs> I know. So, Sobel, Sobel was a great general too, man. He was, he was a, Sobel was like a great backup. I was like impressed that he, that was a great combination. He's, mm. we've become good friends and I, I have so much respect for him. So you look at all the guys you've spawned too. You know what I mean? Mm. That whole, that whole group of people that have worked for you because they respected you. You know what I mean? That's, and like I said, you know, they, we'll get to the steak in a second, but you know, the whole seafood world is a very undervalued, underappreciated, understood entity. People will still eat farm-raised salmon and Vietnamese tiger shrimp, you know, yeah. or, or some city frozen tilapia from China or Chilean sea bass. They go to a steakhouse and they order Chilean sea bass. I just want to take a gun to my head when I see that. Not only from the culinary perspective, we don't even get into the fucking aquaculture environmental perspective of all mm, this, right, but that right. has, that has, and scallops, you know, like people, oh, I love scallops. Like, do you love scallops that have been salt and sulfide? So I can't right, even get yeah. a, a crust Sodium on them. Triphosphate. <laughs> all, all that stuff that people don't pay attention to that we need to understand and be the purveyors of. Mm. So, you know, with that growing up and respecting you and, you know, Eric and every other chef that I've ever known in my life, <clears throat> truly to become one of you, right? To desire to become a real chef, you have to respect those that came before you. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think we're losing that in this world. And that's the one negative side to television and all of the good <laughs> shit we get is people just, they move on to the next, man. It's like a very disposable, yeah. very politically driven, unfortunately, I think semi corrupts world that we had to exist in. <laughs> we don't want to time out. <laughs> no, look, exactly. Jean-Louis Paladin. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a sin to God that people don't understand what that guy brought to America. He has two star yeah. Michelin. He's two star Michelin in France, came to America to check it out. Didn't want to leave because he fell in love with the, the quality of products that were available here. And he was frustrated because we weren't taking advantage of it. Him and Rod Brown. You know, they, yeah. uh, Rod Mitchell from Brown, you know, they, uh, well, that's his middle name anyway. So, and he, he uh, you know, they started at the diver scalp because he made it happen. I, and I had a podcast. No, with it's, Rod. it's, it was, it's true. I mean, you know, but then, then you see the life of a chef, you see Jean Louis, this brilliant genius that mm -hmm. the world totally respects. Right. But how many jetons did he smoke a day and to get lung cancer? How many pans did he f throw across the kitchen? How many people did he curse out? How many meals did Jimmy Smith have to hide at the Watergate because they had too much salt in it? Because John Louis would be like, more salt, you must taste the food. You know, like it's like, <laughs> and people didn't understand something seasoned so perfectly. So, you know, like with the genius comes the insanity. And I see that we come out of a world where you and I are both, I think, maybe quite ahead of most people but also crazy to most people. Their perception yeah. of our, they oh. don't understand our passion and our drive, right? Yeah. So the guys that got ahead of us or got more media attention, they were the, they were the really super talented ones that had, that could just ca stay calm mm -hmm. and they never faltered. They didn't have a down. You know, they just had a slow, slow upward spiral. And then I look at, you know, like I look at great friends and I don't want to mention, but I look at a genius chef like Scott Bryan, you know, and I watched him with his troubles in his life, yeah. you know, like, and I know he'll make a comeback, you know, it, it's, he has enough support and enough talent, you know what I mean? And it's not that he, he needs a comeback. It's just chefs. It's a hard life. Oh, he had his older. chapter in the book too, you know, Scott. Yeah, you no, know, I know. And his talent is like, it's, we look at each other and say, what a, 
what, where's that talent? You know, why isn't it? Why, it, but it's within him. He's got to take dig in his own heart and bring it out. And hopefully he will, because we'll all rejoice as a result. You know, I see it. I see it in some American chefs, like the next generation. Like mm-hmm. I travel a lot. So I'll, you know, I'll be in, I'll be in Colorado here. So I'll, I'll spend some time in Denver right. with Justin Brunson or with Alex Seidel. You know, I'll go to their restaurants to see what's happening because it's a hop, skip and a jump from Texas, from Denver to Dallas. You know what sure. I mean? So, I, and it's a totally different pulse. You know, Denver has a different scene than Dallas does totally. Mm -hmm. But I see, I see Alex has a great like chef to cuisine, but he's going to go on now to be his own chef of a restaurant. Right. Right. Which is a natural progression, but he's never been to Europe. Right. Never worked in New York. He's been to the beard house and he's had opportunities. He's traveled with Alex. But, you know, I, 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 I would think the times I've made the biggest mistakes in my life is when I bit off more than I can chew. Right. So you got to realize that it's business. Mm -hmm. So if you bite off more than you can chew, you're going to get your, what, you know, what pushed in, you know what I mean? You're going to lose that Or you got some catching up to do quick. I've never taken a job I was fully qualified for ever. Yeah. Why would you? Yeah. But if you lose, you get, you get pushed back in New York, you get pushed back to the the back of the line. You know, the vine, I did chefs and champagne one time. Shelly, I love Shelly, Long Island at the Wolfer estate, right? The, The night before, I got my one star Bill Grimes review, right? Right. It was, it was, and it was, it was a real bad review for the rest, yourself. for the rest. Of, and you know what? I was between Bobby Flay, Alfred Portali <laughs> and Rocco Despirito. And I was just like, I was an outcast. No one would even talk to me back then. It was so powerful. It was like, it was like you had stink on you. Like I, we are all three star chefs. What are you doing here with us? You one star, you, you low life, you You're standing You're there like, with spoons of caviar. Come to me, <laughs> come to me. I'm like, like whatever, please. Somebody talk to me. I'm like yeah. with a bottle of champagne, like drinking <sighs> over here. You know. Yeah, but I mean, you know, those, you, those are you, the greatest you, moments of my life, though. Yeah, they, they are the the lowest ones. I mean, the lowest ones in the business sense, right? Mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't want to get you know my personal life. I've made some really serious mistakes, but yeah, that's, that's between me and my family. You know, we all have that life. And I don't think it has any place in the, in the business world. Um, and everybody knows about all my ups already anyway. So no, I'm only matter. nice to you because you know too much about me and I don't want you to bring it <laughs> out. <laughs> you know, I, I, we all have our demons, but I have uh, the, only the ultimate respect for you. But, I, you know, from those dark moments and lucky enough, I've been able to survive and find kind of like my soul and comfort with myself just mm-hmm. recently and overcome like my parenting issues. I have children now, you know, and I really made a, a, a promise to myself that if I had children, I would end any dysfunctionality in the family chain moving forward because I knew the pain that it brought me. Mm-hmm. And I'm blessed with um, beautiful, healthy boys mm-hmm. and one very older girl who doesn't talk to me. But, you know, that, I learned from that too. So like it, it's, I have no choice but to make lemonade out of lemons. Yeah. And, and I, I planted the lemon tree and I picked them, you know what I mean? So, but there was nothing wrong with that. And I'm sorry to anybody I hurt along the way. And I truly am. And I've really kind of made amends to all of them in some regard or tried to, to the very most. So at a certain point, I believe you do have to free yourself at this point in your life, you know, and forget about. Forgive yourself. Yeah. And, and, and then it carries over to the business world, you know, so I didn't get that one from food and wine and James Beard, like seven times, to- you know, like. You got to get it out of your head. Susan and I, I really had, to, yeah, I, I had to get it out of my head, you know, and, and, you know, and, and it was great being friends with, you know, one being friends with, I mean, it's insane. Think about this. I, I, I came up with Bourdain on one side before nobody knew who we were. And then Josh Ozersky and I become like the best of friends in a car, in a car driving to Boston, we became the best of friends because I love the guy and he was going to write my cookbook right before he passed away. Mm-hmm. And he goes, come to me with Boston. We'll talk in the car. Yeah. I got to know a little bit about you for the forward or the intro or the, you know, the, the, the beginning of the cookbook before we do recipes and, and meek shit, you know? Mm-hmm. So I spent 16, 18 hours with this guy going to Boston, eating in five restaurants, right? He falls asleep on the car, on the car ride on the way home. And I'm so tired. And I'm a Long Island boy. Is he driving? Boy. No, he, I, oh. Ozer- I wouldn't let Ozerski drive. <laughs> <laughs> you kidding me? <laughs> Like we might as well give him the space shuttle at that point. <laughs> He'd still be sleeping with a cigarette, like wasn't going to drive it like that. <laughs> but um, I actually I was so tired. I went the it was a we hit a blizzard right when we hit 
the Triborough Bridge. Mm -hmm. And I started to go out to Islip. Until I saw the LIE sign Islip, I was like, holy shit. So Ozersky made me take him to Boston for 16 hours, eat five restaurants, drive both ways, right? In a blizzard, falls asleep. I had to go from Islip on on a wrong turn off the Triborough Bridge, right? To drop him off in Brooklyn as an apartment and then finally go home to my house. Wow. So that's how we became like kindred souls. And he was there the night Leslie Brenner tried to screw over knife and it was it was funny, you know. Uh, your your uh, your clearly uh, public battle with her was it was pretty pretty epic, John. You know, it's one of those things that I think is dangerous. It's kind of a trumpism because people misinterpret what my message was to that mm-hmm. woman. I got it. And 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 someone needed to say it, but everyone was afraid. You don't you don't you didn't tell Gail Green herself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You don't tell even even now I have total respect for anybody who's the the food critic, you know, right. for for any major publication because they, they deserve it. Like Bill Addison is mad with me because him and Pete Wells were I forget they were tweeting back and forth like Bill had just become the new editor. He replaced Jonathan mm-hmm. uh, in in uh, gold in in L.A. Right. Right. And they were talking about his first visit was to a pie shop. OK, so and then and then Pete was like, oh, it's so cold here in New York. Oh, I want to. It was like I want a slice of pie, too. Yeah. And I talked to Pete about it. No, Bill's mad at me. And Bill used to like me. He's mad. At, he refuses to talk to my PR people. He refuses to talk oh. to me. He doesn't want to come down to look good. He wants nothing to do with me. And, and he really we had become friends at the mansion. He told me I had to chartreuse uh, souffle at uh, Robichon in Paris. Mm-hmm. And I came back and did the mansion after I worked with you and we had been to Robichon in, uh, in Vegas yep. uh, when Steve was the chef and I had that same chartreuse souffle and I'd never mm-hmm. had chartreuse in a souffle before. So I put it on as a, one of the desserts in that chef's room that I built, right. you know, and I had all this like China, that stuff that Thomas had with the little yeah. tokes on it and stuff. So yeah. I put, I put it inside a big, you know, it's like a, it was this, a this little pot inside a big pot with a lid and Bill fell in love with it. So he wrote me a thank you note. And he gave me five stars. And then when he left Dallas, he said, I just want you to know, blah, 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 blah. Love the chartreuse souffle guy. So I, you know, and, and through a mutual friend, we've always kind of like run things back and forth with each other. So, you know, it's the danger of Twitter and it's the, it's the danger of social media that people misinterpret like texts and tweets and stuff like that. And nobody is engaged. That's why I love doing podcasts because you get to engage in a conversation. And in that conversation, not only am I going to learn more about you or the topics, I'm going to learn more about myself and how I reacted to them then and how I feel about them now right. and how it relates to our business, because that's really what this is about. You know what I mean? We could tell, I, I mean, there's a personal, our personal life drips into this, but this is business. And if people doesn't realize that this is a, a, a major business in this country, mm. you know, that, and it's suffering right now, it's suffering, you know, and I feel, John, and, it's I, it's a, and it's a double-edged sword for me, Rick, because when I see people like Tom and people who have made millions from television, from books, who are so talented and so prolific and have brought so many people into the culture and have deals in Vegas and South Carolina, right? And they're on the internet doing demos from their home and begging for legislation for restaurants. I, I, like, it blows my mind, yeah. the state of our business. And you know what? You could talk about it. I want to ask you a question now. So, oh, I mean, I, I'm always fascinated with you. I truly am. <laughs> what, what, who can you consider would, to be your mentor? Would it be someone from the very beginning on in your career? Do you have, or is it just a conglomerate? I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a chronological list of mentors. Okay. And you can ask me anything you want about them so I don't go on forever and ever. Okay. So the first one would be Billy Thorne, who owned Magic's Pub, mm-hmm. where I learned how to... And, you know, it was a place in a time in the 70s where every soap opera star, every politician, you know, who I'll give an example. I tell the story all the time on Sunday afternoon with Jimmy Nulligan, who was my partner at Hampton Square. I'd make Bloody Mary mix. I'd wash dishes by hand, including silverware. Mm-hmm. And I'd make tuna fish salad mix for the chef. But I got to talk to George Plimpton, Pete Hamill and Jimmy Breslin all at the same time at a six seat bar for hours on a Sunday where everybody's at the beach at the Hamptons. These three Irish schmoes are sitting at a bar <laughs> writing the next story. 
you know, and, and Pete Hamill was going out with Jackie O at the time. So everyone's like railing on like, so there's, there's five guys in a bar in the Hamptons that normally would be at the red lion in the West village. And Bourdain and I used to go over to the red lion right. where our friend was the bartender. See, we sure. skip, we go down these roads with these stories. We just go forever. Uh. So Billy, Billy Thorne introduced me to the glamor, the respect, and the business side, what I saw is a very loose business side of the restaurant business. Mm, you had a right. silver bullet, you took cash, you know, like there were no credit cards. Like you did. All that, <laughs> all that stuff back then. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about that, right? <laughs> so then there was Pierre after that. I went to work in a real French restaurant. Pierre mm. was my serious mentor. Mm. Um, he brought a chef in from France, uh, two of them. One worked for Lenote as a pastry chef. Right. One, Willie, was a crazy, crazy MF go to discotheques and trip and stuff like that. But he's a great saucier. He taught me what a sauce was. Yeah. There was no more Swiss nor there was no more roux. You made beurre blanc to order with the right white wine and the right butter. Yeah. So this was like, right. So I'm making veal marengo. I'm making demi glass. <laughs> I'm making real beurre blanc. Right? And I'm American. This is in the seventies. Yeah. Turn of the 78, 79. Mm hmm. You were, you were working I was right out of Code school. Basque. Yeah. You're working at the Code Basque. Or That's something right. Like that, That's right? a saucier. Yeah. <laughs> so you know the exact thing roasting bones. Like, yeah. no, it, American chefs didn't know any of this nonsense. Mm -hmm. You worked with some African American chef, Booby, that smoked a cigar. You made demi glass from Swiss Noor, if you were lucky, right? <laughs> and they made chicken stock from a package. And it was like water with this like yellow film on the top of it. <laughs> yeah, no one made fresh pasta, any of this stuff. It was terrible. It literally was terrible. It's funny how now bone broth is like such a big deal. Like, well, that's what broth is, you know? Bone broth. I know. Don't get me started. You know, only because what's this? I forget his name. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But um, God, amazing chef, Italian chef from the restaurant in the, in the East Village. I've been out of New York so long. Hearth. All right. Marco Canora. Oh, so oh yeah, Mar yeah. Marco started the bone broth. I was like, I saw him one day. We did something in Colorado. You invented that? <laughs> No, he, I, I said to no, him. No, I'm said, saying that, that him. I said, bone broth? Is, is that stock? Or is it, is it consomme? Is, is, it, is it, what is it? It's fucking stock. <laughs> like, you know? it's, it's a bunch stock. of bones that have been boiled. But it's John, okay. I was working out. When I got into low cope ask, I was lifting like 50 pound boxes of veal knuckles and dumping them into the, into the, you know, the roasting pans and filling the ovens with them. And, Oh, heck you know, yeah. and you're making the second stock to make your, you know, your glass of beyond and all these. Yeah, no. So Pierre was, Pierre was very influential. And my first right. job was I had to clean a case of New Zealand racks of lamb with a cleaver, no bandsaw, yeah. to chine them. So I had a chine. You learn how to work with your wrist with a cleaver, a small yeah. cleaver. Mm -hmm. And then you had to learn how to French the bones. And I was never one of those guys that did the rope. That's a I, didn't, I, I, I didn't learn the rope trick to a long time. You know, to, 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 it was too late. So and th those were my jobs. And then, and then I moved up to Saucier. So, so from Pierre, I would think after that, it was Gregory Usher, at La Varenne, mm -hmm. who, um, who really took me in at La Varenne because at the time I was dating a, a young lady whose mother was in the Dames de Escoffier in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. She was very connected. Her husband was a lawyer that worked in Paris um, for IBM. So she knew Anne Willen. She knew Julia Child. She knew Simone Beck. And so I was introduced to this small group. I had a group of six people at La Varenne. So I would go, I, I lived in Paris. I met some lady at a book shop and I got a, a you know, a nice apartment. She spoke English, uh, very lucky. Mm -hmm. And I met Gregory and I, I would, we'd cook and six of us would cook all day, have lunch with a little wine every once in a while. Sometimes Julia Childs would pop in, Simone Beck would pop in. And then in the afternoon, we watched a demonstration with people that would come to Paris, maybe 30 people with two, three star Michelin chefs. Right. And it was just, it was priceless, priceless, priceless. And then from there, Jeffrey set, set me up with stages at uh, Jacques Cagne, Jan Trois du Passy. He set me up with Mr. Saltner back in New York. And, I, and you know, Henry Mir was the sous chef. I worked there one day and I couldn't, I couldn't stay with the commitment because Pierre wanted me to come back out to the Hamptons. Right. You know, but I, I could have worked at Lutest at the time because Gregory. So he, he was the next mentor. Henry Mir, I've heard that name in a long time. And then, then after that, I have to tell you, there was a long gap in between. I mean, I had a lot of heroes, but... You were the next, honestly, the, the next mentor because I had kind of been out on my own. I took that corporate job in Tahoe after 9-11, after 44 right. and 10 Hell's Kitchen. Mm -hmm. I got my uh, stuff, you know, beat up after Vine and then I did 44 and Hell's Kitchen, which was refreshing because I saw that movement to like neighborhood, casual, fun, 
elevated long before a lot of other people saw mm-hmm. it. Sure. I, I always kid, you know, when I see Wolfgang, I said, I thought of those pizzas long before you did, man. I, was just, <laughs> I wasn't in the right place. I wasn't in the right place. You know, I had to live that in 13 Barrow Street. I had to do all those fancy pizzas because I was like, Wolfgang, fuck with these pizzas. I thought of this 20 years ago in New York. It was like, it was like some frustrated guy in a movie. You know, we're married <laughs> to Barbara Lazaroff. Let's get this. Let's call her <laughs> <what it> is. <laughs> That's good and bad. Anyway, she's a very nice lady, though. Right. So after you, you know, you really changed my career because, you know, I, what I realized was like, there's a time and a place to take a step back. You know what I mean? Like if you're on a, if you're on the Yankees, right? The Yankees, right? Mm-hmm. And you're, say you're Gardner, right? You know, you hit a home run every once in a while. You play a great left field. You play right field. You, you know, you're, you're, you're around. You're a great baseball player, right? But then there's, you know, then you just meet like Judge, you know, like he's like, seven foot tall, hits home runs at will, you know what I mean? Doesn't have to do much, you know, or a natural talent, you know, and then you got to take a step back and watch that natural talent. That's one of the greatest gifts any young apprentice to get to work for a master of their mm-hmm. art. And so working for you, you are a master and you have a, a great mind. I've, and not, I don't think people really give you enough credit, not only for your mind, but you have one of the most amazing palettes in the sense that no matter what dish I brought you, you could tweak it to the point where anybody blindfolded would like it because it's by what it tasted like. And then all we had to do is just work on like how to get it into the mainstream visually or get the waiters behind it. If it was an uni thing or an abalone thing or, you know, something that wasn't mainstream for people to eat, you know, but but we had everybody that what other seafood chef other than you and Eric repair and maybe chair Musti, does people, do people bring shit to like, I grew up in the, in the Hamptons. People would bring me fish. Mm. The greatest gift you could give an Italian guy is a mm. fish, I think. You know, yeah. like, if, you, if you grew up in that southern part of, you know, I'm Irish and Italian by, by birth. You know, um, my father was Irish. My mother is obviously a small Italian woman, I tell people. Sicilian, possibly. So when you bring me a fish, you know, like, to me, it's like the greatest gift you could give me. And when you get to know the fisherman and the life of a fisherman and you see it, it doesn't have to be a commercial fisherman. It could just be somebody who loves to be out on the ocean, loves to sit on the bay and understands the aquaculture, understands the environment and lives in that world because, you know, the world is what, 95% water, right? Well, yeah, it's a lot. The same amount of water in your body as the earth. And I say, we're just, we're just yeah. ocean. Well, we're oceans. Lot. We're oceans wrapped in skin. That's all we are. So let's yeah, talk about I, aquaculture for a second. I'm, yeah, sure. You, you mentioned it. So, you know, I've been through my points in my career where I was beating the hell out of aquaculture because it was, it was a mess. The, the mm-hmm. impacts on the environment, the, uh, you know, natural, natural, uh, the indigenous fish were now being kind of pushed out of their own, their own uh, neighborhoods. And, you know, fish choose where they want to live because it's perfect. So that's where you put up, that's where you put your fish farms and it's a perfect place to put them. But then you're displacing all of these fish and escapes now competing for the food that those fish need to leave. And that's just one of the 15 items that were like uh, alarming. But fast forward, you know, as I've seen in my own career is um, things are being done a lot more uh, sensibly, you know, there's a better symbiosis between the farming scenario and the natural environment where you're not leaving a black hole where you had, you know, your, your farms, you know, and like the ocean raised our, our podcast is based on a company that's not, hasn't opened to the public yet. It's called forever oceans. And they're working on a Hamachi, you know, a, an amberjack that'll be their first um, anchor, but then they've got grouper, you know, red snapper, you know, these are the, and, and, and the, and the, clean, the re- super clean fish, really beautiful fish, but you don't see it yeah. in the aquaculture circle. And, 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 you know, and I know that as we were being presented different things that were coming out of farms, a lot of times we were just trying to like them, you know, and like, eh, for sure. Th- I'll do the best. Well, they're, I can they're, they're muddy or they taste like the feed, you know, like even, you know, Michael Passmore and I have become very good friends. Thanks mm-hmm. to you. Right. Yeah. Good and, and he's changed over the last, I've watched his progression. So like when I first started eating his sturgeon, mm-hmm. right. I tasted the meal that he was feeding that sturgeon. The blue green algae. Yeah. And then he changed it and then it got less, you know, like gamey, muddy and Mm -hmm. more natural. And then you and I have also had wild caught Pacific white sturgeon. And I'm just going like, whoa, you know, (laughs) and, and, and I don't think people understand it. I think sturgeon is a great fish for an example because people like caviar, 
Yeah. And they don't know what sturgeon is, but they like caviar. Right. And they don't know that that fish has to be 10 years old. And you have to biopsy and all these things that you have to do to this fish. But the fish is itself, to me, when it's, when it's a pristine, beautiful sturgeon, it's the veal of the ocean, mm -hmm. I call it. Texture is you know? amazing. Yeah, and, and you could, like, I had to learn with abalone, you know, you let a little bacteria get into it to tenderize it. Sturgeon goes through rigor mortis. Mm -hmm. You let a little bit of bacteria into it. Yep. You let it sit for two or three days, aging. You know, we're Steak. talking about aging ste steak. I'm aging fish now. You know, not as much. I, I'm having a little difficulty. I've read that young, I forget his name, the gentleman in Australia that dry ages fish. And yeah, to me, that's yeah. like... I, that's like smoked fish from us growing up, you know, like right. you, you, you drop it in orange juice and you, you put it in a smokehouse, you let it hang on a hook, you know, and then it's okay. Cause salt mm. and sugar, you, yeah, you do make processed. the best to, to this day. You still make the best smoked sturgeon brine ever. <laughs> I teach everybody that brine. It's, it's amazing. No, I'm serious. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. That in your gravel ox recipe. I mean, you have a lot of great recipes, but those two things I still do to this day because you can't get any better than that. You know, so that, that, that's my point is like, you have to you work with people that teach you and you have to expose yourself to that. So after you, after there was a long time after you where I thought when I had worked for you, I thought I was finally prepared. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why when I was approached to, to kind of come in behind Dean, I said, you know what? I've been in Vegas. I've been in New York. I saw this whole thing. I know how these hotel guys work. Mm -hmm. Right. I can give this a shot. Yeah. Right? Not knowing anything what I was about to walk into. And that's who my next mentor was, Dean Ferry, because wow. to come into a place and replay. I mean, Dean is an icon. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. No matter what you no matter what your opinions of any chef or whatever it is, we all know Dean loves to play guitar and all this other shit. Dean was an icon who created Southwestern cuisine and was the yeah. chef of this iconic hotel for almost 30 years. And you go into this at the time when I was 15 years ago, I came back. I went into Dallas after I left Vegas. It was a very small town still, you know, Texas has changed. Dallas, Austin and Houston have really grown exponentially in the last 10 years. I mean, like beyond people's wildest dreams. Yeah. And it's been a, it's been a land of opportunity for me. And, you know, like working for the Perry's people that you see the landscape there. There's a lot oh. of money there, a lot of restaurant, a lot of room and, for restaurants. And, they're, and, they're, and, the, and the culture there, they're, they go out every single night. They have to yeah. have that social oh, yeah. gathering. It's 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 in the religion, you know, yeah. and that just blows your mind. You go into a bar and it's four deep. And you know? Dean embracing Dean embracing me and Tim Byers embracing me and Stephen Piles embracing me. But Dean was the catalyst because Dean is the godfather, you know. He is Dallas. Like it doesn't matter when you talk to people from around the country, people know who I am, they know who Steven is, they know some other chefs who have won awards or done anything, but everyone's like, you know, Dean. First word out of their mouth when you talk Dallas. So Dean and Dallas were the same, you know, so Dean kind of giving me the stamp of approval and taking me out and accepting me. And then Bill Addison saying John Teaser is not Dean Faring was a great thing to kind of separate us to, into individuals because right. I do respect Dean not only as a chef, but as a human being. He's been very kind and very loving to me. And I kind of walked into his kingdom right. and he, op he came in with open arms. So that would be the next the next mentor. And, you know, even though I never worked for him through Bourdain, Eric Repair has always been a spiritual mentor of mine. Mm -hmm. Because every time I go from Ben at the front door to Aldo with the bottle of wine, from reservations to the wine bar, to generous generosity beyond belief and, and hospitality, they've been an inspiration as restaurateurs, as professionals, yep. as associates and friends. And then the, let's face it, the food of La Bernadette, a lot of your servers, when you closed RM Seafood in New York, where did they go to work? They went to work for Danielle and they went to work for Repair. Yeah. Seriously, and they're still there. That's like I, I, I went to, the night before New York shut down, I was in La Bernadette and three of your servers were still working the floor <laughs> at La Bernadette. See, I wanted to hate Eric Repair. I wanted to because we're always, you know, because it was the competition, <laughs> the, the French based and loved and the Francophiles that would write about. He was, they always got the four stars. I, would, I was left with three. You know, sorry, and I wanted sorry, to hate buddy. him. I really did. And then I went on a trip in, uh, in Norway with him. And he's just such a wonderful guy and funny and talented and everything. And I'm like, why are you doing this to me? You know, and, and, and I, of course, you know, since then, I've he was the always had respect. Straight. He was the perfect straight man for Bourdain. The perfect straight man. It's like you couldn't, you know, it's hard to like the things. I have a lot of opinions and a lot of stories about Tony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, for a different time. 
But the thing that always struck me the oddest was that, you know, Tony, for, Tony loved chefs. And he would always have this, I, it wasn't social climbing, but he had this progression. He started with me. I introduced him to Scott. Scott introduced him to, to Eric. And then mm-hmm. Eric opened the world because Eric's Eric. Right. right. So it's just to be part of that and to have experienced that and have Eric let me be part of that yeah. has been very, and like he was the kind of guy I'd eat dinner and you'd be like, you have a Comey, you have a kid in Dallas that wants to come and work here for a week or two. Let him come and work. My door is open for anybody you want to come for the longest time. Um, or I could call Ben right now. You know, I hope indoor dining is going to open up again in New York. He would get me a table tomorrow night. You know, what I mean, they just, they're just, they're like kind of family, but professional family. When are you so and I, I going to have dinner at La Bernadette, John? Like, you know what I mean? That you, would mean the world to me because it would bring together. Let's do it, buddy. Yeah. When they let's, open up, it's a date. I'm going to open up Laguna Beach, seafood restaurant, Outer Reef, coming yep. to the Marriott Cliffs Resort and Spa. Dana Point, but it's on Laguna Cliffs, it's and we'll talk about that too. I'll throw that in quick, real quick. So I wanted to go, go back to, to to the gentleman with the meat. So like I was asked to do a steakhouse, and I do have this nightmare. I remember like Charlie Palmer Steakhouse in Mandalay Bay, mm-hmm. and I love Charlie and I love Scott, and you know I've, all of the guys that work for Charlie are always amazing chefs. Mm-hmm. Charlie's an amazing chef, but I went there one night and I was like, this is a famous chef who put his name on a steakhouse, a really nice steakhouse in a Las Vegas casino. I don't want to be that. I'm, I, I can't do, I'm not Charlie Palmer. I can't do that. Right. So when they asked me to come into to knife, which I called knife, mm-hmm. the Highland hotel, I had to be a steakhouse. So I went to every steakhouse in the country. Even before you work for your present, uh, your Paris. associates at Paris. Yeah. And what I saw was just like traditional steakhouses, great wine list, nice piece of meat, Mediocre sides, right. great service, a lot of hospitality, big check. Yep. Right? Yep. So I said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to use the whole animal because this was the time when everyone was using the whole pig. You know. Right? I said, you know what? We're going to use tongue. We're going to use, you know, we'll, we'll put all these things. We'll find clever ways of using these things and hiding them in the menu. And then we'll use culotte and flat iron. By that, I've been to France. I get it on all the French bistro. So all this, all this world is like meat. And meat has always been like easy to me. You know what I mean? It takes a lot longer to cook. I tell people that it's like seafood only takes four minutes to cook. It's the greatest. You want to be the chef of a seafood restaurant? Because the pickups are so fast. <laughs> you don't have to worry about anything. Like, is the rack of lamb overcooked? It's been like 40 minutes. You know, come on, man. <laughs> Piece of fish. If you're gone 10 minutes, you give me another Screwed fish. It up. <laughs> give me another fish. You know, so it's in that way, it's kind of simple. Because you like you, you are where you start is where you're going to end. Right. And it's all about your plus in between. Meat, I think, is one of the biggest things that's taken for granted in American culture, right? People eat shitty hamburgers and go, that's a great hamburger. I'm going to go, no, it's not. They didn't have the pimento. <laughs> the one good thing about being John Tezar is I've always been the guy that says, hey, the emperor's not wearing any clothes. <laughs> and sometimes the room turns around and goes, Tezar, shut the fuck up. And I'll go... No, the emperor is not wearing any clothes. So they just go like, get Tizar out of the room. Please just send him someplace <laughs> to give him something to do. Right. And now all of a sudden that I'm 63 and I have a little bit of some success behind me and I've kind of like navigated even this pandemic bless, blessedly. And I'm not taking that for granted. I mean, people are starting to listen a little bit and I don't think you should ever listen to anybody. You should always listen to what people have to say, but you got to make up your own mind. Sure. And so I went out. And the only steak I found that was phenomenal was at Carne Vino in Las Vegas with Mario. And I'd met Nicole when I was oh. the chef of RMC Food. We became very good friends. We've done events together. I have tremendous respect. She's a kick oh, fucking yeah. chef. One of the best, you know, I hate to segregate chefs into men and women, but if you want to talk about one of the best female chefs in America, Nicole is one of the best female chefs in the world, in the True. world, and, and a businesswoman. So she let me she let me into the world. She took me out to that big meat box down yep. that they had there on Frank Sinatra Drive. And I went in there and I was like, wow. Epiphany. And I saw these racks and racks of meat. And they were white from end to end. You know, and I'm a dummy for the most part. So I'm going like, you grew that mold on the steak? And they didn't say anything. And I looked, I said, what's the temperature? What's the humidity? You know, I asked a couple of easy questions. And then I went back to Dallas and I created a meat box like that with the temperature and the environment and the, and the black mold started to turn white. Mm. 
And I was like, wow, I did what Adam did, right? And then I learned that Adam's been inoculating this shit with Mario's, with Andino's charcuterie mold. Right. And that's how they get the, the, the charcuterie Boom. protects, the bloom to protect. But what people don't realize, like, at a certain point, that white mold is killing anything bad. Mm -hmm. The problem with dry-aged steak back in the day is it would grow black mold, ultra ultraviolet light. Right. And it really, it would, it would bring out the worst parts of the feed and the breeding of the animal and create this kind of death funky thing that grows mm -hmm. great with a great, great glass of big fruity red wine. Right. Right. So I was just trying You're to wrong. find some, I'm trying to find something new. So I'm, I'm like, now I'm eating, now I'm eating 240 day dry aged steak and I'm drinking white burgundy with it. Okay. Yeah. So we're like, <laughs> we're, we're, we're creating revelations that people are just going like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, like, because it's steak. I wrote a book about steak. I sold 16,000 copies because you know why? Cause it's about freaking steak. Who wants to buy a cookbook about steak in, right. in reality? Like, Cause everybody thinks steak is steak. Right. It's not. And that's what I did. And I found, you know, I started off with this, like this whole farm to table nightmare of like, I went to Friedman's Meats and, and I said, find me a true Texas prov provider, right? I'm in Texas. I want to be like local. Everyone thinks Texas is the beef capital of the world. I said, I need a true Texas provider. And she goes, I'll go look. And in the meantime, I had gone to a restaurant on Main Street and I tasted the 72 hour short rib. And it had on there, it said 44 farms, 40, 72 hour short rib. You know, it was like back then when Suvi was like going through the roof. So I said, hey, let's, let's check it out. Like, you know, it said 72 hours. I figured the guy, I knew the chef and I knew what he was doing. And I tasted it and I'd never tasted beef like that. And then I went back to Ellie, who was uh, from uh, the meat company. Mm -hmm. And I said, what's this place? Right. And then I heard about heart brand from somebody else. So that's Akiyushi. So just for the layman, Akiyushi was a longhorn cattle brought from Japan doing a, a trade embargo that was dropped when Reagan was president. We were trying to get, uh, you know, and the Japanese owned everything in America. They owned, I think they even owned Rockefeller Center at that time because Wall Street, we had a recession and the Japanese float, they threw tons of money into, into New York, yep. you know, so, and, and that was part of it. We got this longhorn cattle. So that now that breed is a little compromised because they haven't regenerated it, but it's an amazing steak produced in Texas. But they also had this feed program, sorghum, molasses, fermented cottonseed, right? So sorghum and molasses replace corn, right? We all know. And then, so that, that Akiyushi was a longhorn cattle that could be raised in heat, but they bred it with black Angus, right? So here comes 44 farms, right? The McLaren family who have been in the supermarket business, they own this ranch for a hundred years. Bob's like, I'm going to raise bulls for a living, right? And then we're going to get, we're going to move it down the line. We're going to start with these bulls like Calumet Farms, raises racehorses, right? right? We're going to sell bulls and semen, semen right? Yeah. And propagate, except we're only going to, we're only going to mate or, or, or do business with people that are going to do it with 100% black Angus hide, not 60, not 50, not 40. It's like seafood. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is that salmon wild? Is it, you know, as an aquaculture, is it healthy aquaculture? There's so many questions that people don't know because we have all these catchphrases. So these, these cattle are 100% when we get to 40, by the time we get to 44 farms, they are 100% black Angus, both bull and heifer, right? Now, they don't have a lot of heifers around because they're raising bulls. Right. And it's a very peaceful environment. If you ever get a chance to go to Cameron, Texas, there, or you want to call me, set it up, you have somebody that wants to come and see it. 100%. I will, ta I will take them down there to see the humane, but it's natural too. But And, and this feed, you know, like, for years, people would think cattle had eight stomach linings. I remember the first time I saw tripe was in Rangis in Paris right. with, with Gregory Usher at six o'clock in the morning with a hangover, with a <laughs> wine hangover and smelling tripe. So like, I was like, wow. And people thought they, everything, because they had eight stomach linings, they could do whatever they wanted to, they could eat whatever they wanted to eat. And I'll tell you this now, I, I have a tremendous relationship with Creekstone, right? It's probably one of the best American products Past 90 days, it's touch and go with dry aging because it's a corn fed product that will ammoniate while it's fermenting. Oh. So now we have sorghum, molasses, right? Mm -hmm. The sugar alternatives, natural fermentation in a compost pile. So we have natural fermentation of natural sugars. And then we're going to feed it cottonseed instead of hay. So that cottonseed is indigenous to Texas. Right. So we don't yeah. and, and, and we have we don't have to grow corn because we have feral pigs that will eat shit like cockroaches <laughs> eat cereal in New York City. OK. 
go, you come down to Texas and you try to grow some corn and go to sleep one night when you hear those switchblades in your backyard. Those are the pigs just ate, you ate your entire they're, crop. They're nasty, yeah. In 20 minutes, right? So with all of this like kind of like farm knowledge and all this stuff, I'm watching this amazing thing right before my very eyes. And I'm going like, now let's taste it. We put it in the box. We aged it. 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, 90 days. And when we got to like 60, 90, 120, 150 days, I was like, holy shit. You know, it's one of those moments in your life, Mm -hmm. right? I found something naturally from a process. Uh... So Adam, Adam is a genius. We all know Adam Perry Lang is a genius. No matter what he touches, turns to gold. He's, he's just a culinary genius. He's, he's, I think he's just a genius in life. He, he's like one of the, he can invent shit. He makes <laughs> knives, hand and eye coordination. He's just like, he's an adrenaline addict, but he's just far, he's, he's supernatural, that guy. So I, I took a little bit of this and I, I, I had it natural. I made it naturally. So it's like, I went to France and I wanted to recreate Brie. And he, he showed me how he made his Brie. Mm-hmm. And then I made my Brie. Yeah. Except my mold was like supernatural with a natural product that wasn't going to ammoniate. That's the story of knife. And that what you do is you take all of the that you get in, in all those other, in some of those other steakhouses, right? Yeah. The onion rings where the breading falls off the minute you take the first bite yeah. or whatever your pet peeve is that, you know, the macaroni and cheese that maybe your mom could make better, you know what I mean? You're paying 20 bucks for it <laughs> and there's no need to put lobster in it. It's 2021, you know, the, you know, leave that for like Del Fresco's or something. You're know, like, I, I'm not going to Peter Luger's and eating mac- lobster mac and cheese because they don't serve it. That's why. That's yeah. it. Tomato onion salad. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Tomatoes and steak, and have a bottle of wine. Go home. Yeah. Have some chocolate for dessert or something. That's that's it. So it's about the steak, you know. And so we put in more seafood and all that stuff. But that's really the. It was really. We all search for something, Rick. Is Koji? As, uh, did uh, any play in any of this in the future? What I mean, what's your experience with Koji? Any. I, you know, I, I've played. That's a curious question. I don't have an answer to it. I'm asking you. I've seen people, you know, I've seen Angie do sake lees. I've seen Gerald, who works for me in Orlando, do koji and wrap steak and and do brandy and alcohol. I, it, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I I like the natural. You know, like this is a steakhouse. Knife is a steakhouse. It was labeled a steakhouse, so now it's a steakhouse, sure. right? And it fits in every market in America. It could be any so. hotel in America. Right. And, and it's working. It makes money. It's formulated. And, and, and we put a lot of pride and energy to it. And we're not going to have 35 of them. Mm-hmm. You're not going to have hookers and cocaine when you get there. You oh. know? It may not be glamorous. Sometimes the Ritz is very glamorous, you know, knife and spoon. And we have a lot of seafood. So from the opportunity of knife, I've met all of these hotel guys and owners of hotels, cooperating with management companies and learning how to put my knowledge into their asset so we both benefit. And that's what I learned in Las Vegas when I worked from you is how to deal with guys like Tony Angotti, how to walk down to the accounting office and say, you know what? I made you a million five last year. Can I get some new chairs that don't break? You know, cause you're in this, it's my restaurant. It's my brand. I have control of the chef. I have control of the pastry chef. I have control of the menu, but I don't have control of the FF and E or the bank account. Yeah. However, when the restaurant goes sideways or we get locked down, I get to re I get to reopen and we're protected. Yeah. So that's, you know, now we're entering a new age of the restaurant business. And I think you're going to see a lot more protection going on, or I really think you might see a, a new, I believe in generation, you know, like the, uh, you know, rising from the Phoenix, the Phoenix, the Genesis process right. of like, so all of these like stayed restaurants in New York that were charging too much money and all these cool neighborhoods that were doing okay. Some of them were excellent. Some of them were okay. They're going to close. So now what's going to come behind them? And that's all, that's a whole other conversation for another yeah. podcast about real estate and, and the deal making of a restaurant and how you make a deal and make money in New York city. Good luck now. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and, and, and we all know commercial real estate guys. They're the nicest, most generous human beings in the entire world. Aren't they? Here you go. Let me put on my cough. Uh, <laughs> <here>. <laughs> God. Oh, Jesus. They'll turn around and lock the door while you're still on the stoop. Well, you know, <laughs> You've you've um, you've gotten a, you've you've had many deals and they've come into fruition during a pandemic, and hopefully and, and you know when when something's burning down, you sell the t-shirts that you survived the fire. You know you're gonna we're gonna survive this, and you've always have, and you've got a long history, and you're investing at a time where 
you're, it's the smartest time to invest, in my opinion. I think we, when we pull out of this, John, there's going to be such a resurgence of a need for um, a different style, perhaps, but definitely quality food that you've always been um, this is, had this your is my hands next around. This is my next challenge is how to share, how to keep these restaurants flourishing and then share because I think the restaurant business has always been a little selfish, Rick. You know, I just, I, you know, as having been coming from a dishwasher journeyman cook, having been forgotten, like we talked about, and now all of a sudden being John Teaser, who I don't even know how people perceive that. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's bizarre world for me. And, I, you know, I've had an ego before, but not like that. You know, like it's like, I don't need, and I don't want ever want to be that guy. I want to keep the hunger. I want to keep going. Yeah. I don't, I have no problem dying as a cook, you know, at 90 years old because I'm not going to stop. I'll be huh. snowboarding too. Like, you know, it's like if I can, you know, but I, I think it's, it all comes down to integrity and respect and knowledge. It's very simple, but it's not rocket science, you know, and you can't skip steps. You might be famous for like, you know, or get some fame or some notoriety or make some money for a year or two. I tell people, you and I, how many generations, this is almost five generations of the restaurant business in America. Yeah. We've outlived a lot of really, really popular, famous chefs. You swam with the sharks, brother. You know, and I, I'm saying like, you know, it's it's a it's a really bad joke, and I don't mean it disrespectfully, but like, I wouldn't mention the chef. So I said, but I I don't live those two guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> gotcha. Nobody knows who they are. I'm still around cooking. You know, what I mean that's that's something you have to put back into your appreciation box. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you could have been you could have been an icon for ten years, but uh, you ain't here now. You know what I? I believe you're the architect of this life. You only have one shot at this life. You may have past life experiences or whatever supernatural shit you want to believe in or higher power stuff. That's your stuff. But you got to live this now and you got to do this now. And our business rewards us so much these days, but it asks so much of us. And I think people are looking for more reward and less ask performance of the ask. And well, I just want people to, I want to, I want to shrink the world a little bit. I'm not a hater. I want to see young people come up and be the next thing and teach me things and challenge me and do things. But I don't see that in the world. I just see like the chase for fame and the repetition of what they think is going to get them there. Yeah. There's no yeah. innovation at all. Yeah. You know, like you innovated sustainability back to in New York. I remember getting emails from you when I was at the supper club, when you were working at the water club, mm -hmm. like talking <laughs> about dairy milk from Vermont, you know, and stuff like everything being healthy, a better, healthy lifestyle. And now we're in this pandemic. And what is the one thing that was revealed other than corrupt politics, a bad health care system, is that unhealthy people at a, at a higher risk for any disease in this country. Yeah. And as chefs, we have a responsibility, not a selfish one, to represent the diet food company or to take $10,000 on a website and say, hey, I lost 10 pounds. Great. Yeah. That's a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about in your restaurant with people thinking about the culture thinking about where we need to go. And what does that come from? That comes from great biodynamic, natural products, great relationships with fishermen, with ranchers, yeah. with dairy farmers, with vegetable farmers. So this farm to table thing is not a cliche thing. It's real. You just have to learn. We need a police force. We need a farm to table police force. The story, you can't say the story is so important. Like now, okay, South by Southwest, you know how huge yeah. that is. This yeah. year they're doing it virtually. And you know, the, the, the main subject is, aquaculture and sustainability it's yeah. finally come to uh, the head of an amazing um understanding embrace and, and discussion that was always too confusing to for many people it wasn't worth it just you know there we've got government regulation uh, regulatory agencies that are taking care of everything to keep us safe oh, I, and that is now that of course the, the consumer confidence has, has been brought to a place of reality john now and it's more important than ever that people realize that food is medicine it's what keeps you healthy and you know you are what you eat yeah you every every atom you in your body that is the simplest expression and it may be cliche but it's the truest thing you if you're really a healthy human being you are what you eat and you will see it like karma it's like karmatic you like mm -hmm. i i believe that in life you have you have a lot of decisions to make it's only about decision making so we all know right from wrong when you're an adult and it's, it's you know part of the whole my my whole theory of sin is like when we make the wrong decision that's what sin is, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have to be filled up with all this guilt. It's like, shit, I made the wrong decision today. I have to apologize. The sooner you recognize it, the quicker you get the karma and the relief from it. Yeah. So the healthier you are as a person, you will see the response in what you put into your body, in what you look like, how you perform, how you think, 
how you sleep, how you function, and how you treat other people. There's, I mean, that's the simplest thing of life. If you can't see that, you're blind. Always be humble and kind. Exactly. Always, always be humble and kind. You don't want to die an arrogant asshole, that's for sure. I'll tell you that nah, much. <laughs> you can live one, but you can't die that way. Yeah, man. you can be one every once in a while just to try. You know? <laughs> trying to just buy to, my way to heaven. <laughs> to experience it, exactly. <laughs> hey, so you know, that's how, you, you have to have the extremes if you're going to know what, uh, what you want. You, know, you have to try both I, ends of it. I think if you learn, you know, that, that's the greatest thing. That's the gift I've had to give myself is like, you know what? I'd, I could be down on myself all the time or just like, focus on all the things that I'm not and all the things I've failed at. And then I'm just being disrespectful to all the people that count on me and all the successes that I've had too. You know, like mm -hmm. it's like, woe is me, self pity, you know, like blaming other people. These are common human traits that I think are not very good for society. And I think people need to talk about them. It's, it's okay. You know, like I, I, I think now because I have some kind of modicum of financial success, I don't, I don't care about the, 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 the superficialness of it all. Cause there's so many of us. It's like, you know, I always, I always made that joke when I worked for you. I said, you know what? I'm going to be the only person in the world that's not famous. And then I'm going to be famous. You know, <laughs> think about that. Right. Think about that. That's yeah. American culture. Like, it's like, I have to be famous. Oh, you're famous. No, I, nobody knows me. So when everybody's famous, I'll be the only guy nobody knows. So I'll be famous for nobody knowing me. You know, it's like, John, you're that's famous. Stupidity. We just talk about you behind your back. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to that. <laughs> Jesus. I wrote the book on that, man. Yeah, my, my personality. Boy. God bless you, man. John, it's been like an hour and 20. I usually do yeah. an hour, but uh, we got to okay, do buddy. this again. We got to do this yeah, again. Anytime. And I'm serious right about me and you, Laverne and Dan, we're having dinner and we're going to make. We're I'm going to call Ben there. the minute I can get to New York, let's say in the springtime. Let's, let's yeah. plan sometime in the spring, like All April, right. May. Mm hmm. People will be vaccinated. New York will be opened up again. Right. And I'm going to call Ben and we'll get a night where possibly Eric and Aldo are working and we'll get the full experience. So I'd love to it. share that with you. Yeah. That'd be an honor to do that with you. I love you, John. And, you uh, too, Rick. Thanks for your time, your insight, you. your intellect, your energy, everything about you. Keep it going, man. Just keep it going. Stay hungry. You, you changed my life. You're my main mentor, Rick. So to get an opportunity to talk about these things with you. And, and how many years now after RMC Foods? So we're looking at 2003. We're mm -hmm. looking at almost 18, 19 years. Yeah. You know, that's amazing. 2003 to 2006, I worked for you. I'm purging now. I'm cleaning out old stuff. I'm just taking pictures. Look at you. look great. Works. I'm throwing them great. out. I'm trying. Thanks. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just, I look back on, like, I, these are, well, anyway, like little, I used to have records of everything I had to do, all my calendars. I don't know how I've yeah. kept it up all these years. You know what it is? It's the, it's, the, it's the same thing that we have. It's what's next, what's next, what's next. What's you don't next? Look behind you. you don't look behind you. Yeah, but I'm, I'm learning now as I've gotten a little older, just to spend a few moments. Mm -hmm. not, not days or weeks or months. Enjoy the one moment, like when the customer says, this is the best steak I've ever had in my life. Yeah. And they're not just, and they're, they're like a meat snob. You know? And it's not a competition of like, it's the best restaurant I've been to. It's not the best steakhouse I've been to. It's like, well, this is the best steak I've ever had. It's like when someone eats something, a fish that's been cooked, they've eaten bass their whole life. And they go, this is the best piece of bass that's ever been cooked for me. Because it's fresher. We knew how to do it. We learned how to crisp the skin, right? You know, all those little things that add up. And you got to have your bag of tricks, chefs. You know, I'm, you know what? I'm going to be the last OG because I'm going to be the policeman for all you young suckers out there that think you're going to get away with the shortcuts. Hope I say go on it. to greatness. Go on for greatness. Be the savants. Teach me a lesson. Show me that I don't know what I'm talking about. But you know what? I'm not going to let you take a shortcut. You're going to have to just do it honestly and the right way. Because that's, you know, the one good thing about being the downtrodden, I always love that, you know, or the, the deplorable in the world, is like, you know what, you're seeing it now. You know, like it's, I look, I, I equate it to people like you, you see all the like handsome people and all the beautiful people that you grew up with, right? You see, like, I don't, like we envy them when we were younger. Oh my God, that girl's so beautiful. That guy's so handsome. Like, oh, he had a mustache. He's got a car. You know, all these things we envy, right? Yeah. And then you see the progression of life and they age and they make mistakes too. And that's like that whole euphoria wears off. And, and at the end of the day, all you really have is your word, who you are, your friends and your family. And all that other stuff is really just a means to the end. Yeah. And some of it is mostly an illusion that you inflict on yourself 
But again, it's a great motivational tool. So I'll leave you with that philosophical thought of like Indeed. letting your imagination and your passion and your drive become your motivational tool, but just don't be a about it, you know? John, all the best to you. Love you with you too, all my buddy. heart. Thank you, you so too, much. Man. I'll talk to you soon. I'll see you soon. Thanks, Rick. We're going to have Bye. you down in Orlando. Actually, Laguna. Seafood in Laguna. You. Rick Murray and John me Cesar. There. You got it, brother. All right. Later. Take care, Rick. ForeverOceans.com.